How's it guys and welcome back. Today we're going to be doing something different. We will be doing a teaching video and the topic today is tricyclic antidepressants. We will be discussing what they are, how do you diagnose it and how do you treat it. So let's get straight in. All right, so what is a tricyclic antidepressant overdose? Well, really what's happening with tricyclic antidepressants is sodium channel blocking. There are multiple other drugs, such as these ones, that cause sodium channel blocking, but tricyclic is just a very common one. So if we go back to high school or college where we learned about sodium channels and potassium channels and the um, zero phase and phase one and phase two and phase three and phase four of the action potential, you will remember that sodium rushes in, which allows the action potential, because it hits the all or nothing, hits action potential, the cell depolarizes or the information travels and then the potassium then comes out of the cell because remember there's more potassium inside the cell and more sodium outside of the cell and so that's pretty much the role of sodium and potassium but once you have sodium channel blocking you don't have that quick action potential so everything kind of just slows down but with sodium channel blockers especially with tricyclic antidepressants is that they have a whole lot of other complications so for instance when you have a TCA overdose, you actually have a surge of um, catecholamines and then you have this blocking of sodium channels and a blocking of the reuptake of those catecholamines. So the body is stuck in a kind of a place where they are over stimulated and there is a blocking of the movement of sodium. So it causes lots of havoc as you can imagine. It's the most common thing to, to cause the death of a patient who arrives alive and never leaves again, which, is, which makes us really think about the fact that we need to take this super, super serious. So how do you diagnose a tricyclic antidepressant or sodium channel blocker? The thing that everyone looks out for is a widening of the QRS complex because that is the slowing of the sodium into the cell, which means obviously the cell contracts slower and that causes a widening. So anything bigger than uh, 0 0.12 milliseconds. If you're not sure about ECGs or you're busy learning about that, check this link up here. I have done a video on ECG reading. If the QRS is wider than 0 0.12 milliseconds, then we have a quote-unquote prolonged QRS complex. So if a patient has had a tricyclic or expected tricyclic overdose and they have a QRS of more than 1, 0 0.12, then we have a high likelihood. I found a very interesting algorithm. If you have a look here, you can pause it if you want to take a bigger look. But what's really important is that we need to look at history and we need to look at ECGs because we can put these things together. So there's a trial I found that I will link down to the bottom where they took a whole bunch of patients who had a TCA overdose and they assessed their ECGs and their levels of TCAs in the blood and they correlated very well. So a ECG is actually very accurate at being able to tell you whether or not we have any sort of danger. They found that if your uh, QRS is more than 0.12 milliseconds, you have a high likelihood of seizures or they found, they found that if your ECG QRS was more than 0.12, you had a high likelihood of seizures. If they found if your QRS was then wider than 0.16, they found that you had a high likelihood of um, cardiac arrhythmias. So it's very interesting to know that the wider it is, the worse it is. How do we treat this or what's going to happen? Well, it's likely that they're going to have heart problems. So they're going to have a drop in their blood pressure. They might have a tachycardia. They might have a bradycardia. They're probably going to be hypotensive. They can become confused. They can have comas. They can have breathing problems. They can become apneic. These are all things that we need to take into account. If you are six hours after ingestion and their ECG is still normal, they're at very low risk and can probably be sent home or whatever cases, but those are at much lower risk than the other. So generally speaking, within two hours of ingestion, you're going to have symptoms and you're going to have changes in the ECG. The other point is that how do we treat this? So in the beginning, you're going to be treating this with sodium bicarb, which is one to two milli equivalents per kilogram. Or it's roughly like 100 milli equivalents. Depending on where you live and what dose you use, you're going to give that. 
So once you've given that, you, you will continue to give that until the QRS narrows. This can be done in boluses, doesn't necessarily have to be done in any kind of infusion. Once you have that under control, your symptoms, things should get better. If they have seizures, you can treat them with benzos as you would normally. And what can happen is that if left untreated, a TCA can also affect phase two of your action potential starting to ring a bell with torsades de pont. So what we're saying is that it can move from something that's more simple to something that's more complicated and that you're going to have to treat more things. Because if you're having torsades de pont or you're having prolonged QT intervals, you're then going to have to use magnesium, which could be one to two grams IV, depending on whatever dose or place you're from. So remember, it's not just one thing. It, it could be other stuff. It's also important that when a patient comes in with an overdose that we are able to assess for what it could have been or what it could have contained. So all overdose patients should just get ECGs and we should be looking out for prolonged QT, prolonged QRS, all of these things are super important. If it gets to the place where it's so bad that you have to intubate and ventilate, remember that these patients are going to be in an acidosis. So a really good way to remember how to diagnose these patients is coma convulsions, cardiac arrhythmias, and acidosis. So that's CCCA. The acidosis is important because if you're going to be intubating them, paralyzing them, and ventilating them, you need to remember that they are in an acidosis, so they will probably be running a tachypnea, and so therefore we need to be ventilating them much higher than normal. We can actually put them on a hyperventilation treatment. Because we're going to be hyperventilating them, we're going to have to increase their ETCO2 and when we do that we need to check their pH but obviously if you're in the pre-hospital setting you're not going to be able to do that but just remember that you can hyperventilate these patients quite safely. A blood pH that we want to get is about 7.5 to 7.55 and what we're going to have to run that on is your ETCO2. If you're not so uh, clear or confident with your capnography I do have another video on capnographies. It's, it's really great. I really enjoy making it but that we're going to have to keep the ETCO2 low because obviously if we're making the breathe out more CO2, the ETCO2 should be able to drop. So we can aim for about, so normal 35, 45, we can probably aim for about 30. Well guys, I hope you have enjoyed this. Uh, it's been a little bit different. Let me know in the comments below what you guys thought of it. Um, and just want to know that I appreciate you guys watching this and I see that so many of you have been hitting like and subscribe and that fills my heart with joy and peace and love. So guys, thank you so much and have a wonderful day. Bye for now.